Um, all right, I've got 9.03 on my end. Um, so let's go ahead and call the meeting to order. Um, just a reminder that uh, kind of what uh, uh, Teresa had mentioned before, uh, if every if each member could uh, try their best to keep their cameras rolling for uh, the sake of transparency, that would be much appreciated. Um, and, and Joy mentioned that that was especially important um, when, when you're speaking and uh, when we're about to do roll call. So uh, having said that, Joy, could you help us through roll call? Uh, and uh, yeah, go right ahead. All right, absolutely. Uh, Kelly Bradley. Uh, Scott Bruins. Scott Bruins, present. Sarah Burnett. Sarah Burnett, present. Taylor Bumgartner. Taylor Bumgartner, present. Stacy Earl. Casey Gessenhus. Casey Gessenhus, present. Okay, we're going to go up back up again. Kelly Bradley. Kelly, we're doing the roll. I don't think Kelly, are you on mute? Sorry, I was just unmuting myself, finishing up something else. I apologize. I'm here now. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, Paula Jolly, Justin Mitchell, Teresa Nicholas. Teresa Nicholas, present. Valerie O'Rear. William Owens. Amy Smith. Amy Smith. I think she's here. Joy, I will say this is Teresa again. I will say Amy is in my district, so she may be experiencing bandwidth issues. I'll call and see what's going on. All right, thank you. Uh, David Trimble. Yes, ma'am, I'm present. This is David Trimble, I'm present. All right, and um, Chairman uh, Bruins, we do have a quorum. All right, um, that's great. Thank you, Joy, uh, for walking us through that. Uh, the first uh, listing for our agenda, let me pull that up, is approval of the minutes from our uh, November 17th meeting. Um, I was going to put the link to that in the chat box, but uh, I get a little loading symbol, so I it appears that I don't. Oh, there we go. Um, all right. So if you check the chat box, I uh, linked to our November minutes. Um, hopefully you've had an opportunity to look those over, but uh, uh, we can provide uh, a minute or two uh, just to refamiliarize yourself with it. And Scott, there should be a, a Google folder in the chat for the members to access all of their documents so far. Okay. I'll make that motion. This is David Trimble. Does anybody need any additional time to review? We've got a motion to approve the November minutes. Uh, do we have a second? Casey Guest News, I second. All right. Uh, all those in favor of accepting the November minutes as stated, please say aye. Aye. Any, any opposed? All right. Uh, so motion passes. Uh, let's move on to um, the, the 
the main topic for the main reason why we're meeting uh, during the special session, uh, specifically the uh, proposed amendments to uh, seven uh, administrative regulation 703. Um, Ms. Sims, Stafford, are, are, uh, are you present? Uh, we are, I believe. Jennifer's still on mute, but we're just now working, uh, getting up and, and running. So we are on. Yeah, uh, great to yeah, great to see everybody today. Uh, I still got it. My background didn't pop in normally. So you see my natural background instead of my KDE background. So we'll <laughs> pop that in, in a little in a little bit. So um, thank you so much for being willing to have this special meeting. We felt like since this was going, this regulation was going back for a second read to the Kentucky Board of Education, and you've uh, had a little bit of time maybe to hear some comments and think through the information that it would be important to have another time with you as SCAC. Um, and that uh, we also think uh, as we walk through this today, uh, it's going to be uh, familiar in, to some of you. If you were with us last time, we're going to use a lot of the same information and materials. We've not proposed a change to what's been recommended at this point. LSAC will meet next week. I think it's on Tuesday. And we will expect that they will weigh in on the regulation as well. Uh, so, again, the primary reason for for this reg and the need for revision is that we did have Senate Bill 158 passed in the last legislative session. So much of the work on this is to align it with 158, but it does bring forward a couple. Uh, I think we actually had four areas that we wanted the Kentucky Board to weigh in on, and two of those we've had a lot of conversation around, particularly uh, what should be the minimum number of students you have to have a group, a reported group and accountability. And the second is the uh, issue of weighting. What should various topics or subjects be weighted in the system? So those seem to be the ones that have gotten us the most comment. And I will still say overall, it's not been a huge amount of comment compared to what we've had in some versions of the regulation. Because again, some things are sort of set in, in law and in statute. Uh, with it being passage of 158. So uh, today, you know, we wanted that opportunity. I think last time we met, we did not have the reg in front of you, but only the content of the reg. So we think it's important that you, we just have kind of the, the pleats circle of communication here and, and have you see everything, have you talk about it, see as a group if you want to make any recommendations regarding it. So I'm going to pause and let Jennifer weigh in and I'll play with my background while she's doing that to see if I can get my official KDE background working. Thanks, Rhonda, and good morning, everyone. I hope that everyone had a, a nice holiday weekend, and we appreciate you coming first thing and joining us first thing after a long weekend to discuss the, uh, the accountability system and the changes to our regulation. Um, as Rhonda mentioned, the uh, changes that are coming as a result of uh, Senate Bill 158 um, are significant. Uh, there's four big areas that we want to discuss today, uh, but as you look at the overall regulation, you'll see a lot of red lines and a lot of strike throughs. So um, the format of adding uh, additional language, you'll see that it is uh, underlined, and if it is struck through, you'll see the, uh, the the strike through on it. So if you're looking at that regulation, you'll see that it looks like there's a lot of changes. However, most of the changes are technical in nature or to align to the terminology within Senate Bill 158. Um, We've uh, added multiple definitions, uh, especially around uh, English learner progress, because that's a new indicator. Uh, we've added um, indicator rate, ratings and performance. Uh, the terminology for transition readiness, um, they just simply changed the terminology from transition readiness to post-secondary readiness. So you'll see that that is changed multiple places in the regulation, as well as the indicator that in, includes reading and math and science, social studies and writing into 
the uh, accountability system. In the previous system, it was uh, for reading and math, it was called proficiency. And for science, social studies and writing, it was the separate academic indicator. Uh, now it's just state assessment results for reading and math and state assessment results for science, social studies and writing. So you'll see those changes over and over again. And that's to, again, align the regulation with uh, Senate Bill 158. We've added, again, um, some definitions. We've removed a lot around the uh, achievement gap. The achievement gap per Senate Bill 158 was removed as an indicator or had any influence on the accountability system. Uh, so that's been removed. Uh, other re uh, removals have been about like the comparison group and growth within growth. So uh, the growth, again, that indicator was removed as a result of Senate Bill 158. Uh, so we didn't need all of those um, information about practical significance and um, reference groups and the comparison groups in, in those pieces that were part of that prior system. So you'll see, again, uh, it's a, it looks like a lot of changes, but it's really the same change over and over again. Now, the uh, big areas that uh, we've talked about before is um, the inclusion of status and change into each of the diff different indicators. So what you have is you have the, the indicators that are exclusively listed in Senate Bill 158. So Senate Bill 158 includes this limited number of indicators that can go into an accountability system. And um, those are, again, the state assessment results in reading and math, science, social studies, and writing, transition readiness, the quality of school climate and safety survey, as well as the English language progress, and then at high school, uh, your graduation rate. And that post-secondary readiness that is at high school also. So the, those are the exclusive list and then the uh, the big significance in that is that each of those indicators will be reported for status and for change and then those will be two separate reportings and then brought together in an overall indicator rating or or um, um, overall indicator so those again are the the big changes and uh, one that we wanted to talk through um, was that uh, reporting of status and change. And then the other the other kind of bigger topics that we wanted to to mention and get your feedback on today um, are the the weights and then the minimum in count that it has been proposed. Um, so let me pause at this point because uh, what we thought that we would do is just um, talk through those four big topics uh, and then see if you all have any questions. And um, um, Chair Bruins, it, does that sound like a uh, reasonable approach to you? Yeah, yes, it does. Uh, I especially appreciated the, the summary of changes document that you all provided with the overview of changes and the reason. And I, I think most of these changes are simply to uh, bring the regulation uh, in line with uh, the, the, the Senate bill. Uh, so um, obviously, I, I don't think we would need to weigh in on any of that if it's just, you know, making sure that it's uh, uh, the, the regulation is written appropriately. Um, so, yeah, I think our time would best be spent on those perhaps more sub subjective changes. So, and, and obviously as a group, you're free to, to bring yes. up other things, you know, that we just sort of try to focus the conversation where we've had the most comment and there seems to be the, the least amount of total agreement on exactly what to do. Uh, but certainly any of these things you can weigh in on or others, something maybe we didn't mention and you noticed in the reg and you want to talk about that more than more than open to that. So I have I just wanted to get some clarification on the overall. Sure. 
accountability weights. Could you talk through the changes on that document and why they've been made? Because there's a couple pretty substantial ones. <laughs> sure, sure. And I think you're talking about the summary of changes document, right, Kelly? Yeah, summary of okay. changes document. Yeah, because we have we we are we are well blessed with documents. <laughs> so let's say we want to make sure that we're on the yeah, right. Yeah, I'm looking at that yeah. document. I'll be That's the way you know they, they just kind of keep reproducing there. Uh, more and more, we can certainly do that. I don't know. Does anyone want to Jennifer or I don't know who else you've got online? Did they want to pull that up as we walk through it, or does everyone have it where you can access it? Do Do you want to Rhonda? Do you want to bring up the summary of changes document, or do you want to? Or Kelly, is your comments more on the weights because yeah, we have I, a I just was curious why the weights were okay. Okay. what was the driving force for the changes um and kind of what are the bigger discussions around those um i would say okay. so let me uh rhonda is just a way yeah i think it's just the up. weights yeah uh, just, i'll pull up the um the presentation and tell sure. me if you see it i do I do. Okay, it so I'll just skip Kelly to and others straight to the weight. Right. So as Jennifer's doing that, let me mention uh, a couple of background things. You know, Kentucky has always used an index system since the early '90s, where we put everything together. And the California model that this is really influenced by this current accountability. Uh, with the uh, writing with our state legislator uh, legislators uh, last year uh, did not begin with the notion of an overall score in the end, but rather sticking at that dashboard level where only things were done with color. Now, what that does is it complicates things with the U.S. Department of Ed. The U.S. Department of Ed really is expecting waiting. And so California did not preset weights, but they had to demonstrate the weighting in the actual system when it was put in place. And be, that was one of their uh, back and forth uh, points of negotiation with the U.S. Department of Ed to get their system approved the first time they implemented it. It also meant that California ended up identifying instead of the bottom 5% for support, they had to identify the bottom 8%. Uh, is how the numbers actually played out in the data. There is more a precision, particularly in identifying the bottom uh, that we're required to do federally, if you have some weightings applied. And what the federal government wants to see is that you're giving uh, the desired amount of weight to what they have put the highest priority on which is not necessarily what us as individuals might put the highest priority on or, um, or, or teachers of certain subjects, but there's a strong emphasis on reading and mathematics, English learner progress, and at high school graduation rate. And so they expect to see that to be the biggest part of your system. So if you don't have a preset weight, then you have to in actuality make sure that you can demonstrate those areas are still getting that weight. So the final Kentucky legislation did call for things to be aggregated together. And uh, just in reviewing with this board uh, what that would look like, because remember we got rid of growth, the Senate Bill 158 removes individual student growth as a factor, which we had in for a significant amount of uh, the percentage of the whole in the last system, that meant we had to redistribute uh, that percentage, that weighting to the pieces that are now exclusively listed in accountability in Senate Bill 158. So that's why we've gotten to this point of needing to uh, experience uh, and have in place some weights for the various components. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, Jennifer, uh, let me pause there and and let you kind of uh, do what you were planning to do as well with talking about the weights. So in addition to that, we have um, had multiple discussions with the Kentucky Board of Education. So um, as we were developing and trying to come to um, an understanding of the approach that was desired, 
uh, we had multiple discussions with the Kentucky Board of Education. Um, we presented uh, at a high level in their August meeting. Um, then we had a, a more in-depth discussion in their October meeting. And then we really felt like after that October meeting, we needed some uh, really poignant discussions about each of these four big topics. So in November, uh, they had a special called uh, Kentucky Board of Education meeting. And during that session, um, Rhonda, I, and um, Kevin Hill, and Brian Gong really dug deep into these uh, these four big topics. And during that discussion, uh, in during the November 6th special meeting, uh, we sought guidance from the members of the board on the specifics of the weights. So uh, a few things that came from that November discussion was the fact that um, there was a desire from the board to have different weights at different levels. So uh, you can see that um, in our previous system, there was the same weighting for elementary and middle school components and then different weights at the high school. Uh, from that November discussion, um, there was a desire shared that the different levels should be reflective of um, different weightings and putting more emphasis um, on different parts of, of the system at those different levels. So um, as Rhonda mentioned, that desire as well as the requirement to align to the Every Student Succeeds Act um, led to uh, in part this, uh, these proposed weights. And the secondly, the, the second big comment that came out of that November 6th board meeting was that there was a desire to see more weights on science and social studies and writing. Um, there was a specific uh, guidance that came out of that meeting on the, um, the de desire to see more weight from, the, um, from that separate academic indicator or now called the state re assessment results in the science, social studies and writing. So um, the proposed weights now what they do is they take into account the need for the required percentages to meet and align to ESSA as well as the desire from the board. Uh, so then after that November board meeting then in during our conversation with SCAC um, we talked about the fact that um, those different weights and uh, we had some uh, support from SCAC supporting the fact that elementary weights are different than middle school weights that, that are different from high school weights. So again, the, all of those feedback that we're taking uh, forward has led to where we are now. But I'd really uh, like to hear your comments about uh, the weights and um, if they are, if and thoughts that our members have on those because it's going to be very important as we, uh, Rhonda and I, go to the board for the second read in uh, February, so here in just a couple of weeks, to, to be able to articulate SCAC's discussion and feedback on the weights that are proposed. So I'm kind of curious about the correlation between some of these categories. So I would think that, um, I mean, graduation rates got to be highly correlated with everything in here. So it's kind of a redundancy of measurement in some ways. Um, so it's interesting to me that it's at six um, for that reason, because it's being picked up in every category, I would argue, besides um, well, actually, I think it's being research would tell you it's being picked up in every category <laughs> across here. I mean, it's basically correlated in some way. And I'm also curious the same with and the post-secondary readiness to the state assessments, what the correlation levels are um, in those cat. Like, I just think a lot of this is measuring and I know it has to be broke out, but then the percentages 
one thing I'll just say, like if I look at this from just an educator standpoint, then we definitely do, it, you put your numbers where your value is, whether we say that or not. And so at the high school level, we are devaluing science, social studies, and writing. Writing from a college standpoint, and I'm not devaluing anything else. I mean, I'm a math, I mean, I'm a quantitative and, you know, I'm not devaluing, but we're seeing that writing is highly correlated with basically success across the board and science and writing are highly correlated. So we've got two categories again. There's a lot of things going on here, but I would think at any educator and I mean our chair, I think would maybe speak to this as well. You look at this and you're like, okay, wait. So our reading and math are basically our priority is what and and i just want to say that that's fine but that is the message it's being sent and if that's the case then i would think we could give some directives for some online learning issues going on right now and students failing because if the emphasis isn't in these other things then let's let's make sure they're getting doses in right that's my concern um, about these weights is they're basically there's value in weights so that what i'm seeing here is that post-secondary readiness is just as important as your science, social studies, and writing. So I, I can make a couple of comments and then uh, Rhonda, you can uh, chime in. Sure. So you're, you're exactly right in weight show your values. And um, the, the US Department of Education has um, place the value on reading and math um, and at high school and graduation rate. So in order to align our weights to the, the Every Student Succeeds Act, the, the state assessment results in reading and math and graduation rate must be the majority of the, the weights in the system. So we're saying that with the majority of the weights, it's 51%. So you will see that that uh, that is the least amount that can be given to those two indicators. So then, then you have then forty nine um, percent to distribute among the other components. So then, if you look at that, then where where does that go to? Where does that 49 percent? So you're looking at elementary in, level right now, Jennifer. I just want to make sure that I'm looking at the same thing as you because I only see 51 at elementary. OK, so um, so at high school, it the two components that have to make up 51 percent are reading and math and graduation at elementary and middle school. The two components that must be, make up 51% are reading and math and English learners. So um, you can see that in each of those cases, then the, the majority of the weights have gone to reading and math and um, at the elementary English learner progress and at the middle school the same. So you, you have to have those two at elementary and middle to have the majority of weights. And then at the high school, then it goes from reading and math to graduation rate. So those are the the reasons those proposed weights are there. Now the that other weights because that's can, why it's at six. That's why it's at six then because it has to total fifty one. That's so correct. That's that's kind of what correct. I'm trying. That was my initial. I was trying to get be, behind that. So that's so it is arbitrary in some way. So. So why did it go down to 45? Was there a reason that we went from 46 to 45? Was that arbitrary as well from middle to high school? I would say, you know, all of them in somewhat in what we're proposing it, it's, you know, there's obviously an arbitrary quality, but fitting within all these parameters that we have to meet federally uh, as well as try to carry forward what the board had said, because, uh, you know, Kentucky's had a history of sort of equally valuing all content, but that doesn't quite fit the uh, requirements of the federal rule. So what you end up doing is you have to have that greater weight on reading and math, and then of what's remaining, 
can you equalize it across the other content areas? So in terms of 45 versus 46, I think we were just balancing out the numbers on what was remaining. Uh, I don't think there was a specific uh, reason behind it, though uh, there was some conversation about the role in reading and math at high school versus elementary and middle. And, uh, and you know, again, we had had a combined elementary middle and uh, at least one board member had suggested breaking it out separately and giving a little more emphasis at, ele at the lower elementary to reading and math. So is graduation, I've only talked to, I'm going to be totally transparent, I've only talked to two people from the board since this, so I don't know everything that <laughs> I'm not quite as informed because I'm not in the hallways as much, right? So I have to make um, an effort to reach out. Where did this, why six for graduation rate? Like, why not just five and leave middle school to high school the same so you could argue transition matters and that we're trying to teach content across you know what I mean? Like, I know it's a percent, but it's it just it really pops out to me. I'm like, oh, wait, did it become I, I, like is are we trying to get every point like if if graduation rate is more important than then why isn't it like 10 and you know what I mean? For 39, I you know, I just don't know. That's kind of what I'm getting at. Like where why six? Why did we settle on six? I think six is actually a carryover, isn't it, Jennifer and others from the uh, original bill? That's the that's right. That's what I was the original checking. regulation, and mm -hmm. I think the six was used there to equalize to get to the fifty-one, based huh. on the prior board conversation. So really, we have not recommended a change on graduation right. rate moving forward. Now that if that's the sort of thing you'd like to do as a group, you certainly could recommend a change. In the end, though, we just have to show that. Uh, a little bit over half, we have to be at least 51 when you put those factors together. So it means if you lower one, you've got to raise the other. So you've got to keep that uh, balance. But the six actually, I think, carried forward from the last version. Okay, and I'm sorry, I know I'm being like... No, it's no, it's good conversation. ...than in person because you can't see the whole room and you can't tell if... um, And because I just like... I, I mean, I just keep going back to the science, social studies and writing. So I understand that 51 have to be in those two categories, but that still leaves 49 to be spread across post-secondary readiness and I would in English, you know, the English learner progress, the other categories, there's four categories. So if post-secondary readiness would be correlated with the science, social studies and writing um, assessments and I, I don't have those numbers. Maybe you all do, um, but it would if it was correlated. I would think that the heavier weight would go into those categories if we want to value if if we're going to value what's going on in our actual schools. So Kelly, I think that what I'm hearing is you say that you would be in support of increasing the amount for science, social studies, and writing, and decreasing post-secondary. Is that what yeah, you're saying? I feel like if they're doing what they're supposed to in reading and math and science and social studies and writing, that they're going to be post, I mean, we've seen that. That's kind of, I mean, you know, I, I haven't got to talk to our current commissioner much, but our previous, actually two, especially our previous commissioner talked a lot about that, like what we do in our schools if we do the right things there, we're going to be post-secondary ready. That shouldn't be like, we shouldn't be trapping that. And in some ways, I feel like giving them equal weight is is presenting that. But I'm going to be quiet and let some other people talk because I know I've talked too much. But that that's just, I'm, I'm a numbers person and I'm looking at this and... Um, and you and just to be fully transparent, I the post secondary readiness has kind of got me from day one. And I'm going to just say I'm, I'm even more concerned about it during this COVID era because we see what's going on with AP scores. We see what's going on with these things and giving it. I just feel like we also I think we're setting up our students and our teachers in a way that's unfair. I think we should value what we can control at the best as possible. So I'll be quiet because I'm hoping that some of my colleagues, especially in the classrooms, have some thoughts on it.
Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Kelly. Uh, that was a concern that I had back in our November meeting, um, uh, just about sort of the overvaluation of reading and math. But um, I mean, I don't, I, I think that our hands are sort of tied re regarding that 51%. Um, so I don't have a problem with how that 51% uh, is divided between reading math and, and graduation rate. But uh, I would also echo your concern with the equal division between those two 20% categories. But, uh, you know, I, being a social studies teacher, I, I'm, I recognize that I'm biased uh, re regarding that category. So, you know, in, in, in my ideal world, that would probably be better split 30 and 10, but uh, um, I, 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 I do think it's a valid concern. I have an elementary background, so it's probably better to hear from someone um, in high school. However, I would agree that if there is a stronger focus on science, social studies, and writing, that we would probably would more than likely see an increase in post-secondary readiness. And so there's such um, a difference between the 45 um, and the 20. I would like to see the um, science, social studies, and writing balanced out with post-secondary readiness. And this is Teresa Nicholas. I would concur with Scott in balancing that out, you know, maybe like a 30-10 split between the science, social studies and writing and then the post-secondary readiness. Um, I don't want to devalue the post-secondary readiness because that takes into account more than that academic piece as far as AP or ACT. Um, you know, it's it also values the um, some of those uh, industry uh, cert, so I think that's important. The only other thing that I would add, and I know Rhonda mentioned, you know, messing with graduation rate, I would not mess with graduation rate as far as definitely don't increase it. Um, and the reason for that, unless a definition has changed and rules have changed, you know, our high schools immediately take a hit on any students that they have that achieve the um, alternate diploma they're counted as dropouts, even though they're not dropouts. So it's not fair, I don't think, to increase the um, weight on graduation rate just for that simple reason, because we have no control over that population of students. And, you know, when we're looking at the numbers, I know looking at my high schools, I can say, well, I already know I'm going to have seven dropouts, but they're not dropouts. They successfully complete their program, but we don't get credit for them. So that's just like a slap in the face if on that graduation right. All right. Are there any other thoughts about the the waiting? Are we able uh, to Kelly proposed something in chat about setting graduation rate at five and leaving reading and math at forty six. So that kind of uh, came forward as a a bit of a, su a suggestion. So um, I, I'm not that one's not big. I'm more concerned about the other split, but I just sure. think it's 51, 46, 46. It leaves right. consistency there. I think Teresa's point about graduation rates is really critical, especially in the way it's currently defined. Right. And so I just don't want it to I don't want I don't want these measures to be punitive. I want them to be reflective um, and I want them to tell us the information we we need. But um, I, I just wish we had some true data that showed how if if post-secondary ready like I know we're constru constructing it but in the first couple of years I really hope that we look at correlation between these because it could I, I think that they're just measuring very similar things so really what we're putting forward um, is a value system and so 
that's, I just want to put the right values forward. I don't want us to be teaching less. I mean, if I was going to, like, and the reading is great, it's important. Writing, you know, we're seeing the writing correlation in a lot of the studies, especially in post-secondary, people not being able to write is being an even, we're, we're easy, it seems like we're being able to teach people to read a lot easier than we are to write once they have all these non-things. And they learn to write a lot in social studies and science a ton. So the fact that that's at 20 just concerns me even more for that reason, because those are all correlated subjects. I mean, when we do our state assessment, science and writing, and <coughs> social studies and writing correlate a ton. So we're, ju we're just devaluing them. And I know I'm not, I know I've said that. I just, it's so critical. And as, as our, if enrollments go down because of COVID and things, tough decisions are going to have to be made. And I'd hate to see them being made because of values that we put on something like this. So Kelly, I know that um, I can speak so, to the <clears throat> studies that have been done on our post-secondary readiness or transition readiness measures and the um, success rate in college. And um, there is significance found between um, students who meet the measures of transition readiness, specifically if they're um, achieving AP, uh, any number of AP, um, they are wildly successful if they meet measures of ACT and dual credit, uh, they are um, successful as well. Um, looking at um, any number of AP courses, if they take one, if they take two, if they <laughs> take three, you know, it's going to, their students are going to be um, successful in college. Right. Uh, with, and that same students do well on the state assessments. Uh, um, but what we, what I'm not aware that any studies between the science, social studies and writing is compared to uh, post-secondary or transition readiness. I, I'm just, I'm not aware. I know that with the studies on transition readiness to post-secondary, but not between the two of, with students within high school. Agree. That'd be a good study. We should do it that. It would be. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just for a point of clarification to make sure the whole group is aware of what Teresa brought up around our alternate assessment students. Uh, you know, this alternate assessment is um, a different style of assessment for students with more severe uh, disability. It's sometimes referred to the 1% population because it basically reflects the 1% uh, of the population with the most uh, profound uh, disability. And uh, it's a, you know, one on one administered exam, both the teacher and the student. It's kind of a modified multiple choice. And then we also use some checklists as well. Uh, students, that's a, you know, it's a valuable thing when students in this program complete the program and they receive in what in Kentucky is called an alternate diploma. That's a term the legislature put into place a few years ago. However, that alternate diploma has to meet particular federal requirements before you can enter it as a successful completion and the graduation rate calculation. Again, these are federal rules. They're rules that we've had issue with for years. We're not the only state and we have continued to push on it because we feel like you need to value the work of students in that program and the teachers and parents in that program that are supporting student learning. So uh, it, Teresa is correct in that it does not positively impact your graduation rate at this point. In order for us to get to a place where it did positively impact, then that alternate diploma would have to meet very specific requirements. And I think it's called a state defined alternate diploma. So our special ed office the uh, that uh, is led with uh, Greta Hilton, they have been looking into the possibilities of that and discussing it with stakeholders uh, that was going on a bit before the pandemic. So I can't tell you it's uh, what's exactly where it is at this moment, but for in order for Kentucky to be able to include the students uh, in a uh, as a 
positive in the graduation calculation, the diploma will have to meet those requirements. So that's uh, just the background on that, because I know some of us come from different backgrounds and uh, may not have worked with uh, upper age students and, and students in that program, just so you know. So, where, so that does mean the students that are in the alternate assessment may be completing very successfully with what you've outlined at the school, but they're not showing up positively in your graduation rate. Right, Rhonda, for clarification, they actually show up negatively, right? They do. Negatively. They show up negatively. Yeah, I just want yeah. to make sure it's not. Yeah. It's not they show game. up. It's a yeah. loss. Yeah, that's yeah. Important. it's a loss. It's a loss because they're in the calculation. They have to be included in the calculation. You can't just drop them out. And they're in the calculation as a non-completer. So they show up as a negative in the same way that a, a child that's a dropout would show up as a negative. So, uh, you know, it's a frustrating situation every year that we report. We have conversations around it with the field. And, uh, you know, it's not, in our opinion, a fair uh, situation that values what we ought to be valuing. But it's something right now that we're federally locked down to uh, unless we're able to really change what an alternate diploma means in Kentucky which is a, a little out of our uh, out of our area of expertise. So that's why the special ed office is looking into that. So you've had some good conversation on weights. I guess I would pause to see as a as a group, do you want to put forth any particular uh, recommendation that would go forward to the board or any motion? Uh, and obviously it's something we can come back to at one point if you want to, but um, obviously if you have a particular motion as a group you want to put forward, uh, we would certainly encourage you to do that. Did we simply want to pass on uh, a general recommendation uh, without a motion? Kelly, uh, do you have a preference? I mean, I think that when Rhonda and Jennifer have a motion, it's probably a stronger presentation, but they can probably speak to that because it basically shows that we've agreed as a group to it. <laughs> um, if it goes to the board, I mean, in my that's function, true, that's Kelly. usually OK, that is true. That's what I, I mean. I, I think you just have something that's more centralized. You know, as you said, you've reached a consensus. So that's why if you have a consensus and you feel there are certain things you can agree to as a group, then to put it forward as a motion just allows the board uh, to kind of know where SCAC is. And, you know, keep in mind the current chair of the Board of Education, Dr. Young, uh, yeah. is a former chair of SCAC as well. So she's always interested in what the opinions of SCAC would be on any of these topics, just as she is with LSAC. I mean, I, I'm just going to throw it out there. I would be in favor of a 30-10 with the post-secondary readiness being set at 10 and the other and the science, social studies and writing set at 30. That would be the motion um, that I would that I would put on the table. I'm sorry, just for clarity, um, you said a 30-10 split between the Science, social studies, writing, and, and post secondary readiness. Uh, did you mention anything about the graduation rate in the reading mathematics categories? Um, I, I can, I'm just going to be honest, Scott, that one's not, it's, that's not as concerning to me. And I think putting forward the one um, consensus is probably the best way to go as a group, but I could go either way. I think that we emphasize what we see as the real um, concern here. <laughs> mm. So we have a motion on the floor. Uh, again, that motion is to increase the category of uh, science, social studies and writing to 30 and decrease the post-secondary writing this category to 10. Um, do we have a second on the motion? I mean, I, I will second that motion, but I also want to open it up for discussion before we put it to an official vote. 
Um, does anybody have, does anybody disagree with that notion of increasing one category and decreasing the other? I mean, Phil, it is a okay to disagree with this. Absolutely, so, <laughs> absolutely. <yeah. laughs> and I can't see every the um because the presentation's still up. So I don't even know who we have on the call. Twenty-two people. I'm just looking. There we go. Thank you. It makes it easier to see people. <laughs> if there's no disagreement and if there's no uh if no more discussions needed we can put it to a vote um all those in favor of the motion to increase uh the category of science social studies writing to 30 and decrease post-secondary readiness to 10 percent uh please say aye 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 are there any opposed All right, motion passes. All right, is there any additional uh, conversation needed around these weights? I know we've got some other um, matters to uh, address within this regulation. No, I think we're, I, I'm good. I, like I said, I would just, I would just say Rhonda that, and Jennifer, the t traditional of the point that Teresa brought up is really critical and every point that goes up on that graduation rate emphasizes the negatives of those students and my concern as um, a higher ed like researcher is is that when they have to when these students come in and they're difficult and they're negatively impacting school ratings wrong decisions are made sometimes right because it's easier because they're going to be counted negatively against the school whether they're in the school or they're not in the school and so i just think that's and i know people on the kentucky board of education already consider that so i would just say that's just that general just to support you all in that continued battle i know no one loves the way that's calculated so i'm not criticizing i just want to offer additional support that it does matter and that we should really not criticize schools for bettering our community and educating individuals for success so the way we're operationalizing that sex success is really disheartening to many uh, jennifer can you walk us through our, our next uh, topic within this regulation Sure. Um, I think the next one, um, why don't we uh, go to the next more, uh, uh, to the topic that we've had the most uh, conversation on as well, and that is the uh, minimum end count. Uh, the, other, the other two have um, not got a lot of conversation, so we can um, um, quickly look at those toward the end of the, the presentation. But I think that our time would be well spent here to discuss the uh, the minimum end. So let me let me pull up and remind everyone where we are on the um, the minimum end. <clears throat> let me find that. Here it is, okay. So where we were with the minimum in previously uh, was with um, including the, uh, all of the indicators and, uh, and especially it comes into importance really when we're looking at having the minimum number of students in a student demographic group uh, and inclusion into the accountability system. Um, so specifically, the recommendation here is to move from what we had previously at, with 10 per grade for uh, inclusion of the student group uh, or the indicator into the accountability system to an overall school count. So it changes uh, the um, the calculation 
of how to include the student groups. And this becomes very important when you're identifying your schools for targeted support and improvement and additional targeted support and improvement. Because the, the more groups that you have, the more um, um, groups that are identified to uh, lead that could lead to toward that identification of a targeted support and improvement school. Um, so the recommendation here is to have for accountability that that be an overall total count of 30 students in the whole school. Yet using the 10 per grade for reporting in the school report card. So we're trying to achieve this balance between what's um, transparent and publicly reported and the inclusion in the accountability system. Now, one of the key principles to move forward with this change is the reliability within um, the school and within um, the inclusion of more students. Uh, because the more students that you have, the more uh, score points that you have, the more scores that go into uh, the, a measure, the better reliability that you get for that measure. So uh, with the, the discussions at the, the board meeting, we talked about um, the fact that the more students that you have, the more stable the uh, population is, and then the more reliable than that would be for on a year to year basis. Um, so with this balance, the, the principle of having more reliability within the system was the, the desired effect. Um, so you can see um, that uh, this is, a, um, again, just the same example that we talked about um, in November that this is for um, to demonstrate inclusion um, of an indicator or a student group. So uh, this is a reading and math example and I've used an elementary school of three through five. And in this example, you see that above the line, there's clearly the total number of students um, would exceed 30. So if you think about this uh, as an individual student group, that student group then uh, would go into uh, identification of a uh, of for TSI. Or if this is a, an indicator, then the indicator would be included in the accountability system and it would have that weight then that we just talked about. Now below the line, below the line is an example that is less than 30. So this indicator for reading and math would not be part of the weights and that weight then would be uh, distributed across the other indicators that are included in the accountability system. This is a science social studies and writing example. Now you recall that science is tested at grade four and social studies and writing are tested at grade five. So that's the reason for the, the two grades. This is again an elementary school example, but we just have two grades in here because um, neither science, social studies, or writing are assessed at the third grade. So the example above the line again exceeds 30 students, so that uh, indicator would be included in the accountability system. And then below the line, it, um, it is not because the total number of students then would um, be significantly below the, the 30. Now, I want to point out here that um, above the line, we specifically created this example to demonstrate how that five students and their um, scores on the social studies and writing assessment would be included in the accountability system. So it clearly, um, the total number of students is above the threshold of 30, but grade five only has five students. 
So this demonstrates the importance of those weights and those weights matter because of the um, inclusion of this indicator into the accountability system and, and the uh, weight that those five students would have to include in that measure uh, for the state assessment results in science, social studies, and writing. So that's the, the uh, purpose of that example, to demonstrate um, how those weights would um, then unfold for those five students. Jennifer, I'd like to just kind of add one point of clarification to make sure everybody is on the same page. Uh, we use the term school and we talk about reporting 30 for a school. We really in Kentucky have what's called a school level system. So uh, if you had, for example, mo most schools in the state are a single level. So they're in elementary and they only have either K-5 or maybe a K-6. Uh, however, we do have some schools that are K-8s. If you're a K-8, we're going to report you as an elementary, and then we're going to report you a second time as a middle school. So you would need 30 in your elementary grades and 30 in your middle school grades. So uh, we have a level-based system. So when we use the word school, we're really meaning school level, but it, uh, uh, it you know, our normal nomenclature the you know the words we use is school so i just want you to be aware of that distinction um, and uh, obviously i think you have to we're showing these examples because we started out at a grade based uh, situation with 10 in a grade really you are thinking holistically of the school instead of individually as the grade with this uh, current proposal. 30 is permitted federally. If we go above 30, we would have to have some real strong justification to do that. And that would have to secure federal approval. And frankly, with our demographics, it's probably would not be likely that we could push it above 30. So that's why 30 is sort of the uh, maximum number that we've talked about in this proposal. Did I read correctly that uh, this change would affect uh, high schools more, uh, especially with uh, our uh, student disability populations? Jennifer, I think you're on mute. Thank you, Scott. Um, the analysis document that is included in the Google folder that Pam linked here to our um, our team's meeting and you received uh, last week from Joy uh, does show that at the high school there is a decrease in a number of student groups that would be included um, again for that identification of TSI. So you'll see a, a decreased number uh, at the high school. Um, and I want to say that's particularly with our special ed as well as our English learners in, in different areas. So that analysis was done for um, our previous indicator called proficiency, which would be our reading and math, and then our separate academic. And then you would see the uh, the overall. So you can, you can um, note that though that change would have impact um, at the particularly at the high school i'm still trying i'm struggling to figure out uh, why high schools would uh, e experience a greater change with uh, this 30 in count um, i mean in my mind i'm thinking high schools are typically larger wouldn't there be more students to pull from in in each of these groups it's only one grade level tested though oh that's the i got it. whereas at the elementary you have three at the middle school you have three for the for like the reading and math for those content areas but at the high school it's only one grade level so that's a, that's uh if you look at this slide here you can replace grades um four and five with grades uh, 10 and 11. 
So uh, grade 10 is reading and math and grade 11 is the science, social studies and writing. So you can see um, that that would impact then your your students there. So you go from you go from 10 to uh, at each grade level to an overall of 30. And the the, the calculations um, are um, result in fewer number of students at those grade levels. The thing I find most interesting about this is that it's a Again, it's just it's an N of 30, but that's not a consistent percentage. It doesn't take in school size at all. Um, so you could have five students at one school and that could be actually a relatively large percentage compared to five at another school that doesn't even register. Um, and so just 30 is actually could impact small schools a lot more too. It's not just the high school, it's going to be the small schools as well in terms of resources. So four kids in that school doesn't seem like a lot, but that could be a huge um, issue on resources at that school if they didn't have the right support because it's a greater percentage of their students. So I'm always I'm always interested in how the state decides to just go with like one of the questions in all of my research classes is defend why you choose your N. So give me a power, give me a percentage, give me the rationale why it's why it's like in this case, I would say, why is it 30? Why did we pick 30 and how does that show consistency across all of the different samples? I'll just make one comment to that, Kelly. 30 is what's permissible federally. So we selected at the upper end uh, the 30 on what was permissible. Kentucky has had a 10 rule and for reading and math, it works out most of the time to be very similar to 30 with grades three through five. Where we have an issue is where we have those single tests in a, in a grade level. Only one science, only one social studies, only one writing. Uh, that's where it becomes a, a little bit more difficult We brought this conversation up with the board because there had been a version of Senate Bill 158 uh, that had 30 added as a minimum count, and then that did not end up in the final bill. But we knew that was of interest. We knew there were uh, individuals and in in stakeholders that had been lobbying the legislature to think about the 30 since that is permitted and many states do the 10 reporting and the 30. So we felt at least was a value for the current board to discuss and sort of take their position on it. So that's why it's moved forward with that proposal. We also, you know, Jennifer started at the beginning with, you know, it really is a balancing act and it's a balance primarily between inclusion mm -hmm. and reliability of data, greater reliability. And it's also to some level uh, also in that mix simplicity because you could try to have some varying rules. We might be able to get approval on some of those, but they will become very complicated to implement. And uh, so trying to achieve sort of a sweet spot with all those requirements was why we brought forward the 10 for transparency and public reporting, but the higher number when it came to uh, actually formally in accountability saying you qualify for a, a group for accountability reporting. So that's kind of the uh, the reason behind the numbers. Now again, you know, it would be a bit simpler if you could just say, well, instead of a minimum man, we'd like to do a minimal percentage. But the way the federal law is set up, it's really set up to be a minimum man. So who does it who does it benefit and who does it hurt? Who gets the biggest benefit from doing it this way and who is gets the the who potentially loses resources because that is really an issue of equity. I I don't think I can speak as clearly to the resource issue and I appreciate that you, that you've tied that in because in reality it does become how do I divide up what I have. Um, I do think when you look across the grade levels uh, for the reading for reading and math there is not a great difference in elementary and uh, middle school. We might in fact uh, pick up a few more groups where they've had 
you know, account like 9, 10, 10, or 9, 12, 12. So actually we could have some greater reporting and emphasis on certain groups. And the more common of those groups is the students with disabilities in the state. Uh, you know, we, we our racial uh, groups are fairly localized to certain parts of the state, but every district has a certain number of students with special needs, and they also have students in poverty, or nearly all. So I do, so I think at elementary and at middle school, there's not a great deal of difference other than we might pick up that. High school, I think it's more of a difference. Uh, and, and you would you ask who would benefit? I think high schools would benefit more with going to the 30 count because it is right now because of where we, we only test in two grades of high school. We're really sort of applying more like a 20 count uh, because you got 10 in the in the subject. So I think that uh, high schools, there's a more positive change for them in the sense. And, and when I say positive, you know, you have to balance this again with looking at groups and group performance. But I think what comments got brought to the state legislature uh, were things like, but is it is it fair that I have uh, a group of only 10, but maybe I have a high school of a thousand? Because our high schools tend to be a bit bigger. Now we do have small high schools as well. And that's the complication really with the minimum men. Uh, we don't mandate that every school needs 300 kids and uh, that every school must you know have as a minimum 300 or 400 or 500 nor should we but uh, that kind of complicates this because you're setting up a rule then that has to be used across all kinds of configuration of schools so jennifer i don't know if you'd have anything else to add i think i'm going to have to move something around here i'm getting a little too much sun at the moment are we able to have one in count for elementary, middle, and a different one for high schools? There's that a discussion has has been brought up before, um, and so um, we think that that is um, just a, a discussion that could be can be had and taken place. But while Rhonda was making her comments, she made. Um, statements about the simplicity of the system and implementing that um, in the system. So um, thinking about how that it would be uh, operationalized within the schools and within the districts from uh, differences between one to one school to the next would have to uh, be considered as well. And again, trying to get this balance between um, the transparency, privacy, simplicity, reliability, all of those different um, components coming together um, to develop this minimum end count. Are there any other thoughts regarding this minimum in count? I was. Uh, I, I know this. This is not a uh, strong area for myself. I, I was hoping to uh, rely on uh, Kelly's expert opinion. I don't know if you have any other thoughts, Kelly. No, I think this one's tricky. I mean, I, I see where Jennifer and Rhonda are coming from. And this one, it's it's just really hard because the more complicated you make it, the more difficult. I mean, I, I the simplicity part. I would just note, and Jennifer, I know you all know this, just to be on record, that reliability does not guarantee validity. And so we should really be talking about validity of these. And so um, reliability is just consistency. And so we could consistently do this wrong <laughs> and we want to do it right, which is validity. So we need to we need to make sure that. Um, that that's my biggest concern, and I think that we we just need to make sure that resources are going to who needs them. And so I think more of a recommendation just to consider school size because that does that does matter, <laughs> right? We know that. And because a small school that has nine students that gets left out is way, that's way more critical than, 
maybe resources of a school, a larger school that has 10 and gets it because you know what I mean? And I know that these cutoffs have to be there, but the research just tells us that those small school, like our rural areas do not have enough resources to start with. And then any calculation that's going to take more resources away, I just think that we have to pay attention to that because that's going to factor into their long-term success at institutions like mine of higher ed, right? If they want to move on. So that would be my biggest thing. I don't know. I don't have all the data in front of me that you all do, but I would, I would say looking at what just for your own benefit and you probably have just seeing what percentage that is in each school would be interesting to see how much those percentages fluctuated with an N of 30. So what does an N of 30 mean at each of those schools? What percentage of students that is? That would probably just be good information for you all to have and present. Um, that would that would be my big thing. Without that, I feel like I can't even say, yeah, it should be a different number. Does that make sense? All right, well, um, yes, Kelly, it does make sense. Thank you. It sounds like we don't have any uh, different recommendations uh, to go away from the N of 30. Um, Scott, I do have one question. This is sure. Teresa again, um, mm -hmm. and I understand the need for the simplicity, but and and the in count of 30 and pushing it as as the feds would allow but doing away with that 10 per grade level um i'm just i'm just really curious and again i understand the simplicity but if we're going to suppress the individual score school scores at the grade level if your student count is less than 10 then why did we do away with that as one of those criteria in even looking at this identifying the groups because again and even with the example that um, Jennifer shared and I'm I'm thinking more not somewhat reading math reading and math but even science and social studies when you go back to just that one well no even reading and math but like the one example you say you have 25 at, at fifth grade but only four at three or six at at four, it's still, I don't, it's still that, just that one grade level that is having such a huge impact on the overall school. And I'm not saying they need to be addressed, but to me, that's a, I don't know how to express this. That is a specific issue with a specific group at a specific time. And they need to be addressing that, but it's not necessarily a a big school issue, especially if the the lower grades are doing okay. But the school is going to be identified in that whole TSI or AT. I don't even remember the acronyms now. <laughs> category for that that one group that pushed them over the threshold. Does that make sense? Yes, I think it does, Teresa. Right, thank you, Teresa. Are there any other thoughts about in count? Uh, Jennifer, was there another uh, part of this regulation that we needed to weigh in on? <clears throat> yes, we have. Let me share my screen again. If I can find it. The other piece, and this is more of a, a reporting issue um, with combining status and change into a, a performance rating. So um, you'll you'll note that within the regulation there are changes that the <clears throat> the overall indicator will be reported for status and then we be reported for change. And so that that's a significant um, difference with the prior accountability system where we just have the overall 
um, performance rating of the indicator. So for, for uh, status, uh, that's something similar that we've done um, previously. Uh, that is the current year performance. Uh, that's what we've had for years, you know, the current year performance in reading and math, science, social studies, and writing, all those things that we, we have that current year. The change is the difference between that current year performance and prior year performance. Um, we'll, we'll stagger this in for uh, accountability. We'll start first start with status um, in the system and we'll report on it first. Um, the status will be reported in a uh, terminology of um, very low, low, medium, high, and very high. Uh, change will be reported in terms of um, decrease significantly or decline significantly, declined, maintain, increased, or in increased significantly. So those two pieces will be uh, reported individually. And then the overall will bring those two pieces together for the overall indicator rating then that second year of the the system when we get to the fact that we have two years of uh, data that can be um, compared so as a reporting aspect now this is not these colors do not play into the um, uh, rating uh, but as a re reporting aspect of the um, the overall. So there'll be numbers behind each of these and there'll be cut points uh, for each of the these um, these reporting categories. But let me pull up here kind of the recommended reporting categories and then the um, recommended one. OK, so um, when you can see from this table and you'll recall this table uh, we used in November uh, along the uh, left hand side, you'll see this the, their status and the terminology will be uh, reported as from very low to very high and each of those rows then uh, reflect the status of that performance uh, for the indicator. And then across the top um, is change. And you can see again that it's uh, from decline significantly to increase significantly. So you can expect <clears throat> that there will be a different colored, colored table for each of our indicators. So there'll be one for uh, reading and math and science, social studies and writing. There'll be one for EL progress. There'll be one for post-secondary readiness and graduation rate and so forth. So each of these <clears throat> will be different and they'll differ slightly as the, the system is developed. The concept that we're, we're seeking advice on is this recommended um, or the alternate table. And I'm gonna pull up both of them side by side so you can see that there's differences. Um, you can see that uh, lower performance is in red. Um, you can see down here in box A that the low performance is, is will be reported in red. The upper top right hand side, uh, box B and around box B, the higher performance will be reported as blue. And then we have these colors in between that are green, yellow, and orange. Um, which vary uh, depending on how then the uh, school performs in each of the combination of status and change. Um, so if we look at particularly the differences in um, this, these two tables, and it's in the row of medium. So you can see that uh, of status. So the medium um, status uh, or performance in the current year um, between the two tables, uh, the recommended table on the left and the alternative table on the right uh, for reporting. The recommended table on the left, you can see, has a little more distinction in that medium row. So you can see that um, for medium, if we look across that medium row and we look at decline, you can see that it's orange 
And if we continue over to the right, medium and then declined from prior year, it's orange as well. And then if we continue to the right, medium and maintained is yellow, then medium and increased and in change from prior year is green. And then a medium status and increase significantly from prior year is green as well. You can see that in the alternative table that there are instead three yellow boxes for reporting. Um, so that's really the difference between the recommended and alternative um, tables. Now, the reason for the recommended on the left is to provide more distinction in reporting uh, categories uh, between the, the school that either declined from prior year or increased from prior year. So just giving that um, bit more of distinction. Because if you look in the alternative, you would see that a school with medium status and declined would receive the same color overall color rating in this indicator as if they had either declined or increased from the prior year. So we wanted, again, to provide that bit more of distinction between the performance of the schools. So let me stop there and see if there's any questions um, about how to interpret or, Rhonda, if you wanted to add anything about the, um, the bringing together of status and change for each of our indicators. Jennifer, I think you did a great, great job. Uh, keep in mind that the color table itself doesn't appear in the reg. This is more to help us implement the reg, uh, and it would be something that would show up in our state consolidated plan. Jennifer, I think, kind of mentioned that to begin with. So this is to give a, a broad outline exactly when you would move from one of the boxes of the table uh, or pieces in the grid to the other it depends on the actual numbers that are along those cut lines and that would be a standard setting process and the current uh, statute uh, sets up LSAC to be a, an approver of that uh, as well as the Kentucky Department but we would bring people together to do standard setting so the table with how big the sales are might vary a bit based on uh, what uh, component we're looking at for example when we look at graduation rates uh, we're at a very high uh, level of graduation rate, so that table might look a little different uh, than a table for something where things are more distributed kind of equally. Uh, so just to keep that in mind that, they, you know, this is an important background piece and we've chosen to talk about it as part of this conversation because it fits that, but you won't actually see the table itself being in the regulation. This is just to give a, a good little uh, direction to the standard setters later and to our work. So I guess, Nathan, we're ready to see if anyone has any questions or comments uh, on this. Uh, uh, again, this one uh, we've had, it's been sort of well received on the recommended area. I don't think any group has come out to say they prefer the alternative. They like the uh, more distinction on that middle row uh, rather than having so much yellow on it. Yeah, personally, I would definitely agree with the recommended table as well. Are there Somebody used to ask if there's anybody with SCAC that has a concern on the recommended table versus the alternative or or a different kind of uh, comparison. That they have a preference for the alternative. I would agree with Scott. I would say the recommended for the simple fact, especially on that medium row, um, you know, the orange on the decline from prior year, I think it's significant between that orange and green, placing that orange and green there. I think it's important if you're looking at your median performance, are we headed in the right direction or the wrong direction? Well, that green or orange indicates, am I going in the right direction or wrong direction? Yeah, it's kind of a tipping point. Yeah, and to uh, if you're in that sort of median category and you increase, you know, that, that should be something to celebrate, you know. 
All right, any other thoughts or concerns? All right, well, I'm, I'm glad to see it going in that direction. All right, if we want to move then to the last big topic that we have, and this was uh, n literally nobody has had any negative comments on it, and it's about the um, indicator of our English language um, uh, progress uh, students. And that is that we bring in the flexibilities that are allowed per the Every Student Succeeds Act. And uh, what that is, is that we can bring in um, and reflect into our um, accountability system those students that have had uh, interrupted schooling, have come in with low, very low um, English language skills, and um, have uh, <clears throat> been uh, parts of um, like war torn that they have not had um, um, continuous schooling. So uh, in our previous <clears throat> regulation, um, the wording I think was may, we, we may bring in those flexibilities upon research in the current change to the regulation is that we that we shall. So uh, that is, you can see that as part of the uh, amendments in that regulation. So that one has, uh, again, not received any negative feedback um, as far as um, being included into the accountability system. So um, I don't know if you guys want to to talk about that or, but that was like the, the fourth big thing uh, to, uh, to bring in and allow those flexibilities into the system. What are those, what flexibilities would that include? For example, so, specifically COVID include COVID. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being serious. Like, I mean, where's the, where's the COVID statement for all of this? <laughs> well, uh, I will note for you that um, uh, coming soon is a, uh, a addendum to the ESSA state plan. Uh, the U.S. Department of Education has uh, given us some direction on how to apply for relief from identification of um, comprehensive school and improvement and additional comprehensive school and improvement or additional targeted support and improvement. So CSI and ATSI. So uh, that addendum to the state plan will be uh, released very soon uh, for public feedback and um, will then be uh, submitted to the U.S. Department of Education after that for public feedback is gathered. They have also indicated that there is a waiver process for relief from identification of TSI, which is targeted support and improvement, and the department is waiting right now for further guidance from the U.S. Department of Education. So uh, we look forward to having that guidance from them as well. But they've they've got a little bit of stuff going on this week, and so they may we may not get that uh, guidance this week, but we're certainly looking forward to it and um, completing it and submitting that uh, that relief from those identifications. And Kelly, most of it, you know, of course, there's particular funding uh, that is going to be available uh, to assist schools. Um, another round of GEARS funding. And uh, but then out sitting out that sits outside the accountability system. But basically, uh, the federal government is uh, allowing everyone to sort of uh, push things off by a few years in order to the fact that we didn't have testing across the country last year. We're not quite yet sure what's going to be uh, permissible this year. We've been told to prepare for testing. So Kentucky has prepared for a streamlined version of the assessment, but we don't quite yet know all of the uh, ins and outs. We expect to hear something probably pretty quickly. Uh, in January, but we we don't yet know the rules. That's part of this not knowing about TSI because TSI is an annual identification. 
but obviously we have uh, some bills that have been filed in the state legislature, uh, basically uh, offering the Kentucky Board the ability to waive things in alignment with federal waivers. So we'll, we still have a lot of balls in the air and eventually they're gonna settle down somewhere. And we know everybody's eager for that. And believe me, no one's more eager than our office to have everything settled. Um, obviously it's a, a lot of uncertainty, but I think uh, the most helpful thing uh, is the ability to have some flexibility to recognize this is a very odd uh, year uh, and really continuing of a year for instruction and that schools have, in, and I've heard you say this so many times so well, Kelly, that they have some resources to help step in and do some things that we know are more needed now than ever. And so I think getting the influx of money into schools is gonna be a, a very helpful thing to that and, and maybe allow schools to, you know, to do more and, and to go beyond kind of the, the status quo we would hope uh, as well. So I, I think that's, that's moving right along. I know that uh, the department has mentioned it in one webinar to superintendents last week, but we're still waiting on some more detail. And I think guidance is expected um, out of the department probably uh, before the the 10th of February. I think it's uh, sometime in that first week, probably after the board meeting, that we should have everything in line to provide guidance on that funding. Yeah, and I, I, I appreciate all the work you're doing. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a lot, and I know that. Um, I sure. think that sure. we're seeing the same thing. I think that we don't as a high as the higher ed rep we don't know what this is going to look like in three years from now that's right and right. that's yeah. and that's really important to think about like you know the eighth graders that are freshmen that what are the recoveries going to be over the next three years the that's right. the people that lost their junior year that are in their senior year and every school in this state looks different and they're more like we've talked about inconsistencies before but the, and we could have things like this again. I've, you've heard me say it before, like there's so many awful about this, but it also gives us, it's given us a full disclosure of inequity like we've never seen before um, because people have to see it. There's no choice right now, right? Um, and so that that's one of the, I mean, you hate to say positive, but it is because maybe we can all see now that resources, because people are like, it should be the same. I think that, you know, some, I mean, I'm in a county that has not had one day of face-to-face -face school. <laughs> right, or, that's right. Um, you know, not a single day. Not a single um, day. Yeah, so it's like there's, and there are definitely students in my county that are impacted more than others, schools that are impacted. So even within a county, it's different. So I, I recognize that you all see that. Um, I just don't want it to be a one year. That's my big thing. Like, and I just want to say that since I know these things are coming through because it's not one year, it's not two years. These students are going to be impacted into higher ed, the high schoolers and the elementary and middle are going to be impacted. You know, it's, it's just, there's a long-term effect of this. And so we're seeing the same thing at higher ed. People are like, well, we'll do a one year waiver. And those of us in assessment are like, one year is not enough. You have That's to do right. a three to five year basically plan of action of what comes when we do come out of this. And so so I feel for your office. I appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, and I just hope that we continue to collaborate K-12 to higher ed through sure. these things. But just definitely note that as you're working through those, like keeping these clauses in and these like special circumstances and stuff are going to be so important because I can totally see a freshman that didn't get the baseline class that they needed or the instruction this year getting to their junior year and being tested in a subject <laughs> and not being college ready and is that right. is that fair to the school or that student like we need the resources to make sure that doesn't happen but if it does we need the resources to fix it and prepare them for higher ed or for right. career opportunities or whatever so I, I know i'm speaking to everyone on this call that knows that and cares about it but this is our opportunity to voice that and i just wanted to do so no, thank you, Kelly, and I appreciate that. And you're you're absolutely right on that. And one thing that, you know, we we didn't start here with our introduction comments, but really the reg sort of sits out there as if COVID didn't happen in an essence, because the reg doesn't have a, a COVID focus because that change around COVID comes through as Jennifer introduced the addendum 
and waivers and those kinds of pieces. But again, those will be critical things moving forward because it isn't a one a trade off of one day for another. The impact of one day uh, with not maybe the full instructional normal benefits that you have doesn't mean that I get one more day and if I make it up, it's all going to be OK. It's going to take a while to overcome what we've lost. And just my typical shout out to all the teachers that are just oh, in their butts and it's appreciated. And as a higher ed, I know that, you know, you see lots of pros and cons, but I know everyone's working. And I just want to acknowledge that and say how much I appreciate that, the work that's being done. Yeah, absolutely. So Jennifer, you were talking with us about the EL. And, uh, you know, again, everyone so far has been very positive. If there are some waiver opportunities for English learners that we should take advantage of those. And basically it's uh, to calculate uh, for them to recognize that they have things like the interrupted schooling and to put that into the uh, sort of the growth tables that would help generate that. And one reason you don't see those growth tables actually in the reg is those will require some negotiation and approval with the US Department of Ed. So they'll sit inside our consolidated plan instead of inside the reg. So the reg mostly lays out the uh, requirement that we will do those, that we will seek those waivers. Right, any other comments? All right. Uh, Jennifer, I take it that's the, the extent of the issues that we need to address. Those were the big topics that um, we wanted your feedback on. Um, but if there are other pieces of the regulation and those amendments that um, members would like to uh, ask about or have questions or feedbacks on other topics that we haven't brought up, we're certainly open and uh, we're hoping to hear from you. Yeah, I think the summary of changes document was just really helpful in, in understanding the reasons behind those changes. I think that was pretty thorough. Yeah, I think that had the stamp of many people in our office, but particularly Michael Hackworth, who's our policy advisor that does a lot of our regulation management. So he's a very thorough guy. And so uh, I do think that's a very helpful document because you can see that many of those changes, and as Jennifer said at the uh, introduction, there's a lot of strikeouts and new underlines. So really it looks like the change is really dramatic, but in many cases it's changing terminology to the current statute and uh, just reflecting what's in Senate Bill 158. And then of course these additions that we know to be in alignment that we've asked for your feedback on. I'm looking, I don't, oh, uh, yeah, I, I guess, Michael is listening in, so thank you, Michael. <laughs> yeah, I think I think he's online there. Gave him a little shout out. Yeah, appreciate you. All right, any other concerns? Any other topics to address? If not, um, does anybody have a motion to adjourn? Or we want to hang out a little longer. This is Teresa Nicholas. I took me a minute to get my mic unmuted. Mm -hmm. I will make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> right. Do we have a second? Kelly Bradley, I'll second. All right. All those in favor of adjourning today's meeting, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, we will see everybody in a couple months. Uh, I think I saw March 16th, so uh, put that on your calendars, March 16th. Good to see everybody. Hope uh, next time we see uh, one another that uh, most, if not all of us, will be vaccinated. Now, there you go. <laughs>
Thanks, everybody. Stay safe and well. We always appreciate your good comments and feedback and the perception perspectives that you bring. Safe uh, safety to all of you. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Joy. Thanks, Jennifer.